Okay, here, look, um, something caught in my eye, so if I'm a bit distracted, that's what it is. Um, just the first question to Ms Campbell is, uh, is Dundalk in a consortium in respect of a technological university application? Not at the moment. Do you intend to, or are you happy enough with where you We are moment? in preliminary discussions with some other institutes of technology, but it hasn't got any further than preliminary discussions. And would that be because of um, concerns that you would have about the process or because of geography or what would be the reason why it's um, not more advanced? Certainly we have no concerns about the process at all. We, um, geography, I think, played an important part in our original decision not to seek technological university status and to opt instead for an alliance with Dublin Institute of Technology, which is still ongoing and we have very good relations with DCU. Sorry, did I say Dublin Institute? I should have said Dublin City University. So we have very good relations with Dublin City <coughs> University. However, in, in recent months we have been approached by a number of other institutes of technology and we're in very preliminary discussions with them. And you were saying earlier that is the institute one of those that's in deficit at the moment or is it it's, it's out of deficit? It's, it's, it's Our institute, are, we're, we are carrying a deficit of 3.2 million euros uh, but we did break even on our operating accounts uh, for last year and we anticipate that we will do this year as well. Okay and tell me do you have the figures which you um, in terms of your core funding that you would have got from the department and also the student contribution to fees, which are the two main sources of income over a reasonable time period. So we we'll say uh, from 2008 maybe up to now, we, not each, each year, but is there, like has the institute suffered um, in the last maybe six or seven years? We have taken a drop in 30, of 34% in income. 34% mm -hmm. cut in, in income. In, in the state grant. And is that the primary reason why the institute is in deficit? It, that, that is, I think, the primary reason why the institute is in deficit and also the inability, uh, the, the fact that the staffing, sorry, that the staffing, the payroll is the biggest yes. part of our budget. The CNAG has just told you that at 70% of our budget, at one stage it was 87% of our budget. So, so one stage it was 87, you've mm. got that down to 70%? We've managed, we've managed to get that down to, I think, 70% was the figures okay. that you gave. We, we have reduced our staff number by 22 in recent years. Okay. And in the terms of income streams then, um, just doing some research in, in relation to your own institute, it seems to be one of the top performing ones in respect of uh, research and income arising from research. So how does that work in the first instance and can you give me examples of income streams that have come into the institute from research? Uh, I can. Um, we. Um we, we have performed, we're about, I think, in the top four within the sector for research performance. I think I should say that research income um, really covers research. There isn't, there isn't a profit as such to be made out of, of research, so it, it covers its cost. But there was a period when, it wasn't, when research funding was cut and when costs were um, not met. Would there be a profit made um, with respect if um, intellectual property was commercialised? We have very little, um, we haven't made any profit yet on intellectual property. No, we have two spin out companies at the moment. Sorry, but excuse me, sorry. You, can you just step forward to the mic just for the minute, for this, because it won't be picked up if I'm speaking there. Uh, perhaps while my colleague is going yeah. to talk to you about that, I could give you some of the examples. We have been very fortunate this year on Interreg funding uh, with three projects um, funded quite recently, which will yield 7.2 million over the lifetime of the projects to DKIT. So that is something in the context of Brexit that we are concerned about, that the Interreg projects and Interreg funding would continue, because that is an enormous amount of money. And it's not just the money on research, but it's the value and return from the learning and, and the results Thank of Thank you, research. and I want the folks on the two spin-out companies, mm. so these two spin-out companies... Yeah, uh, they've only just play. recently uh, spun out. We spun out a company in December 2015 and we spun out our second company in June 16. We did spin out a company earlier in May 15, but that didn't really... Um, we, we looked at it, but we couldn't uh, finalise a shareholder agreement on that, so that has stopped. But we have two spin-out companies at, at the moment. Tell me, what would the Institute's shareholding be in both of those spin-out companies? The equity in one is 8% and the equity in the other is 5%. 8 and 5. And who yeah. in the institute then would uh, protect the interests of the institute? So who would uh, decide 
what the equity stake of the institute would be? Uh, that's decided through uh, um, an intellectual property committee. So there is a committee within the institute. And who would that committee report back to? That committee, uh, the recommendations from that committee then go eventually to uh, the governing body. The governing body? Yeah, they okay. said, yeah. Um, and would there be, who would own the policy? So there would always be a policy owner. So if you have a policy, who would be the policy, the policy owner? owner? Not, would, not the governing body in terms of Yeah, the management policy owner staff. would come under my remit as vice president for uh, strategic planning, communications and development. And development. And you, you, you personally wouldn't have any uh, shareholding or uh, no. you wouldn't be a director in any no. companies? No. Uh, and if you were, would you see that as a conflict of interest? Well, we have a clause within our intellectual property policy that if you have any conflicts of interest, you have to declare those at yeah. the outset. So you're, you, would be, you would have a management role, an oversight role? Yeah, an oversight yeah. role. And then yeah. we have a technology transfer office then yeah. that does the day-to-day -day management of the intellectual property, the, yeah. the management and, and looking at commercialisation opportunities. So if, if it was the case that you were a shareholder in any of these two companies, uh, you would also be the person, because of your role, that would have a governance uh, and a management role. So yeah, but you would declare that at the outset yeah. and you'd have to step aside. You would step aside from... You, from you would step aside from any discussions or ongoing negotiations if you had a, a conflict of interest. You would need to declare that. Okay. Um, in respect of... I just want to come back to um, the issue that was raised about the JJB facility, um, if I can. Um, and... Uh, there was a tender for equipment. That's uh, right. Can you talk me through that first? I can. Yeah. Um, we went through uh, the tender process as 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 normal, and um, for the sports equipment for um, the to kit out the, uh, the sports facility, and uh, the uh, supplier B in my submission was a successful bidder for the lease of this sports equipment to DKIT Sport Limited. However, during the final weeks prior to the commissioning of this equipment, the supplier informed us that he was no longer able to meet his obligations. And that centred around, uh, we wanted to rent the equipment from the supplier and the supplier wanted to lease the equipment to us, so like higher purchase. And as an institute, we cannot borrow. The problem was that this was now just weeks before the opening. We had a contract with the operator. Uh, 30 people had um, been employed by the operator to run the facility. Uh, the students had already paid their levy. So we were in a very, very short time frame and had to make a decision. Um, because of the imminent planned opening and the undertakings given to the students and to the operator to purchase part of the equipment instead of renting it. So the operator purchased some of the equipment and we purchased the rest. And so this was just so I'm clear in terms of the process and I'm only concerned about process. Mm -hmm. So there was a tender process for the award of the hiring of fitness equipment for mm -hmm. this newly established facility. That's in the first instance what yes. the tendering process mm -hmm. was for. And how long did that tendering process last? Um, three months, it would take three to four months. Three months, and how many tenderers were there in the game? Five. Five. Uh, and what were the conditions of that tender at the time when it went out for tender? What, what was the conditionality? The, the, the tender would, uh, the equipment would be supplied on a rental basis to the institute. And more specifically, if you can please. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, as the President has pointed out, the Institute couldn't uh, purchase, if we, we weren't in a, a position to have you know, purchase on a lease basis, so we would have to rent the equipment. Because this equipment was so specialised, it had to be itemised and then put out to, pu out to public tender for it. And would it be correct to say that the original tender that went out was actually for the hire of equipment over a four-year term with an option to renew for a further 12 months? I think that's correct. That's correct. That would be correct. And then. Was when the contract was eventually signed with the winning tender, was that the, con was that the terms of that contract? Yes. That was, that was terms yes. of the contract. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so when the ex successful bidder, when the contract was signed, it was for uh, uh, over a four year term with an option to renew for a further 12 months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And now, Deputy Connolly.